Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for the opportunity to take part in this webinar. This is a first for me. I've not done this before. Uh, so here we go. Um, we have been in Warwickshire County Council probably going through the largest and most uh, fast-paced change uh, in our history. We've been tackled, as many councils have, with taking a lot of funding out of our budget, and therefore the, the drivers for change have been very strong uh, and have pushed us to moving quite quickly towards transformation. So we've moved really beyond change, and we're in wholesale transformation. So if you look at my first slide, what I talk about there really is, is the challenge that we faced in that we've had to prepare our organization for the biggest cultural and structural change that we've ever experienced. And we're not alone. This has happened across local government. But for us in Warwickshire, with a staff now of 5,600, we've had to take out £190 million pounds worth of savings over the last three years. And you can probably imagine that that's required rapid transformation and the most seismic shift in skills, thinking and, behavior, and, uh, thinking and behaviors right the way across our workforce. And of course, that's not, it doesn't stop there. There's more to come. We've, we've now, this year, looking at taking out another 60 million. And so that doesn't come without some real pain, without some real effort in terms of how you uh, work people to understand why that change is necessary, to get people's engagement and involvement in delivering and leading that change. And how do you keep people engaged when they're in a period of huge uncertainty? Well, they know that headcount is reducing by 30% plus. We don't quite know what we're going to be doing or how we're going to be doing it. And at the same time, we have got to maintain our essential services. So this has been a huge challenge. And I don't want to undersell that, really. And I also don't want to, to pretend that we're alone. This is very common across local government. Any of you sitting there from a public sector, uh, in a public sector organization will recognize this entirely and will recognize the journey that we've been on because we are not special, we're not different. Um, I'm going to share with you the way we've tackled it. It's working for us. Uh, I'm not saying it's perfect, but for what it's worth, I'm happy to share with you what we've done. So what did we do? Well, a few, while, a few years ago when we realized that we were heading into this period, and don't, don't forget that this has started somewhere around 2008, 2009, picked up its pace in the period 2010 to 2014, where we were under pressure to remove quite significant sums. And so the question we asked ourselves was, well, what do we need to do in order to equip our managers with the skills to manage this change? What do we need to do to get ourselves ready for change as an organization? And what do we need to do to keep people with us whilst we go through this big program of transformation? And we're still in it. You know, we're, still, we're still there. Uh, and it's not going to get any easier anytime soon. So in brief, we, offered a, we, we undertook a radical review of our competency framework to really try to set out what we expect from our managers and what we expect from our staff during this period, which is different from a period of stability. And so actually looking at what it is that we expect people to do, how we expect them to behave, the kind of things that they bring into the workplace that will help lead and shape this transformation, critical, we felt. And if I, under, if I give you our definition of competency, which is the power to perform, so we want to make sure that the power to perform is writ large right the way across our workforce. And the work that we've done has underlined that and made sure that we're understanding what they need, the skills we need to give them, how we need to support them. And so having reviewed that competency framework, we then went to the point where we said, right, we need to now embed it. We need to focus on what individuals are doing within this, what's their responsibility, how we build that up, how we get them to understand you know, what the rules are for operating now, how we role model. Uh, and how we build confident leadership that allows people to, to take others with them. And so we focused a lot of our efforts on um, giving managers the skills to manage change, and in particular, the skills to engage through change. Because we want people to still turn up and still turn on and still be part of uh, important teams doing important work, even though they're under significant pressure. And so we started putting together a package of uh, interventions which would prepare managers to deliver difficult messages, to manage change, to look after resilience, to manage stress, 
to do redesign processes. So we've put a lot of tools into the toolbox of our managers in order to help them be prepared and ready for this business of leading change. And also leading change rapidly. So it's pace that's been really important. So how do you do that? How do you do that quickly? And actually, we've seen that pay off because we've got now uh, high engagement scores. We've got good response to our staff surveys, good input from our staff. And those staff we've got really are engaged and with us on this journey. So that comprehensive suite of learning interventions, really designed to support teams and individuals, has been probably the most useful thing that we've done. And it's very practical. It's very focused on what we believe people need now and easy access, bite-sized sessions, so lunchtime sessions, e-learning modules, access to mind tools, access to the tools that they might need to get really good at delivering this change for us. Because although the senior team have a responsibility for setting the vision and delivering against those objectives which will take us to where we want to go, we recognize that we can't be everywhere. And therefore, there is a requirement for individuals and teams to, to have those skills as well and for everybody's effort to be mobilized in delivering this transformation. Now, the other big thing that we did was to put in place something called the Personal Leadership Program, which is a very different leadership development program from anything else we've ever done before in that it doesn't focus on leadership theory or uh, specific leadership tasks and skills. What this is is a major challenge to people in terms of how they behave, how they live the change, and how they help us through that to deliver the culture change required to succeed through this transformation. And I have to say, I've done an awful lot of leadership development myself. I've been an army officer, so I've done all sorts of leadership training in my past. I've delivered lots of leadership training. But for me, the, leadership, the personal leadership program was probably the most uh, powerful leadership program that I've done in that it really challenged me to be the best leader I can possibly be. It talked about my personal style, my personal responsibilities, my personal buy-in to living the change that I want to see in the world, and living and changing the culture for my team and for the rest of the organization. We've seen critical mass now with that. So we've seen our senior leaders right the way down to service manager level having gone through the personal leadership program. And we can see and feel the difference. So that is having an impact on the way that our leaders behave. And if you're talking about engaging people through change, keeping people going, then it's down to, in my view, leadership, leadership, leadership. And therefore, the quality of your leaders, the absolute commitment of those leaders to lead well is critical in terms of delivering this change. So that kind of is the offer uh, in brief and, and some of snapshot of what we did. The results? Well, we have delivered our savings, uh, but we're now looking at a further 25% reduction this year and then more to come probably next year. So we're not, we're not through the woods yet, not by any manner of means. Our engagement levels are the highest they've been. So in my HR uh, outfit, I've got engagement scores at 81%, and the lowest across the county council is 72%. So actually, we've, we've got a very high level of engagement from our staff. So we're knowing now we've got some good evidence that suggests that these actions that we've taken are giving us the results that we need. Our staff survey results are good. They're consistently in the upper quartile, and they're telling us that staff feel valued, they feel recognized. They feel that their contribution is recognized and valued across the organization. And that they are able to contribute, to bring ideas, and to help us really deliver this transformation. So I'm very proud of these results. And I am very pleased that we as an organization can say that actually we're starting to get it right. We also confirmed through our staff survey that immediate staff believe that their immediate manager manages change well. And again, that's really important to us because we've put those skills and tools in the hands of our managers in order to get them to help us manage change. And we know now that they're doing that really well and our staff appreciate the skills that those managers have. We also have staff expressing confidence in senior leaders to lead change. And I have to say, our senior leaders are good at getting out, running roadshows, being visible, 
engaging with staff and actually having those face-to-face -face conversations and recognizing that people are working harder, are delivering differently, are in a period of uncertainty. So showing that senior leaders understand that, showing that senior leaders are interested in how staff are coping through that and being supportive on a one-to-one -one level within teams and across the organization. There's no, uh, there's no replacing that and putting a value on it is very, very hard, but it is essential if you're going to deliver successful transformation. And also, pleasingly, our customer satisfaction levels have increased, which is entirely surprising because we have removed services. We're asking our citizens to do more for themselves. Council services won't be what they were, uh, and people are having to be much more dependent on digital solutions, on finding things and finding, and we're more enabling. And surprisingly, our customer satisfaction levels have increased across the piece. So what are the key principles in terms of this? Well, leadership is the top priority. I can't stress that enough. I think it's about how leaders lead and how managers manage, and that's what makes a difference in this world. So support your leaders to live the change. Get your leaders absolutely clear about what it is you're wanting them to do. Give them every support to do that, and then they'll let them lead it, and trust them to get on and do that. Because actually trust is, a, is another key element in all of this. But also getting ownership of the change so that people feel part of it. And that's about really good communication through multi-channels. So making sure people understand why, why, why things are happening, why things aren't happening, why things are happening in a particular way. Really getting people's understanding of the vision and the objectives of the organization. And again, if I come back to our staff survey results, most of our staff tell us that they understand what their contribution is to the overall objectives for the organization. And that's really, really important for buy-in for engagement and for leading and gaining ground around this change. It's important to focus people on what's important and build confidence and appreciation and really value and recognize what people are doing. Uh, we've introduced some postcards which uh, suggest that people have done a great job or that they're a top banana or the bee's knees. Um, and those have gone down very, very well in that we are able to give immediate and very personal feedback to people and offer personal thanks. And actually, they've, they've been very, very well received. So it's about focusing. That helps to focus on what's important. That gives people confidence that they're doing the right things. And once you've got those two things, actually, then they'll do more of that, which is about, again, driving your transformation for you. Make it relevant and focus on helping people to care about getting it right. And that's, that's about engagement and buy-in. Do people understand what needs to be done, why it's important to get it right, right first time, why you know, managing your resources well, managing your people well is so critical in that. And it's people who need to accept and embrace change. And you forget that at your peril. That if you don't spend a bit of time and effort really explaining, helping people to understand, appreciating people's positions, understanding their fears, their concerns, actually, if you don't get that right, you're not going anywhere in this changing world. So remember always it's people who need to accept and embrace change. Communicate, communicate, communicate. Listen and learn. And that's about creating space for people to give feedback, people to reflect, people to learn from their mistakes, and giving people the opportunity to make mistakes in this process so that we know that they can learn from those. You can't learn anything from a mistake you never made, and mistakes are proof that you're trying. And those things together mean that actually people will then come up with ideas, will give you feedback, and will reflect on what they're doing and want to do it better. Recognize how long this is going to take, and don't ever underestimate the time required to do it. Um, it will always take longer than you think. This is a heavy, heavy resource uh, process in that you have to get out there, you have to get in amongst people and help them to understand. And that does take time out of, of, of you know, doing what you want to do. So it's making sure that people recognize and your managers and leaders recognize their responsibilities in doing just that. And never, ever give up. And I think that's probably the thing, to keep going. So when the tough gets going, just keep going. That's kind of my um, uh, slideshow and the, and the kind of key things I wanted to show you. So I'm really happy now to take questions. 
Thank you, Sue. Uh, it's really strong messages coming through there. Um, I'll just hand over, just go straight into questions. Um, for those that perhaps weren't here at the start, if you could just use the small grey box on your screen and just type your type your questions in there and I'll direct them to Sue. Uh, first of all, we just got a comment from Denise Bell from Shetland Islands, who's really interested in personal leadership programme and uh, the yep. challenge of how you've approached those managers that do not demonstrate positive behaviours that your programme needs. Right, okay. Um, I think that firstly the personal leadership program, it's run for us. We've commissioned that through a company called The Art of Brilliance, who I can recommend, who I can uh, commend to you. Um, it's focused around some very strong principles of what's accepting 100% responsibility. And when you can get leaders to do that, then actually that's when you get this kind of real um, sense of, of purpose behind them in leading that change. And so I um, I say would recommend that. In terms of dealing with those that don't, then I think actually you've got to tackle that head on. You've got to give people the opportunity to, to have a go at this and give them feedback. So it's applying the same principles to those people who are not doing what you need them to do, actually having a conversation with them and saying this isn't good enough and you need to get on with that. And actually that has started to happen and you'll see that people will challenge. And in the personal leadership program, we encourage people to ask for feedback on how they're doing against these behaviours. Um, and we've got the notices up now in all of our meeting rooms with good communicating behaviours and we ask people to give us feedback if we're not doing it. And you will, you will see it happen. So you do have to challenge that where people aren't doing what you need them to do, you need to challenge them head on. There's a, there's a few questions coming in here, um, just around how you measured um, the engagement levels and staff and also the success going forward. Okay, we use a staff survey which has within it a number of questions which are designed to give you an engagement score. And they're quite specific questions which, which really point to the drivers for engagement. And that is things like people recognised and valued in what they do, that their contribution is recognised, that uh, people understand what you're wanting to do as an organisation. So there are about six questions across a survey of about 40 questions which specifically give us an engagement score and that's how we've measured it. So I know that our engagement score four years ago was 67%. Uh, it moved then to 69%, we're now up to 70%, so we know that we're on a trajectory to improve that. Thanks Sue. Um, this next question is from, uh, from Helena Tompkins from the Environment Agency, who was wondering if we could see an example for, of the competency, competency framework. Um, you can. How do I do that? Do I put that on my screen? If, or do uh, I send it to you, David, to circulate? Yeah, I think that what we what, what we normally do is that um, any resources that are mentioned, which uh, throughout the course of the webinar, then I'll uh, glaze with you following the webinar and we can uh, arrange course. to have all them circulated. I'm really happy. Good. I'm really happy to share our competency framework. We're just going about revising it, but you can certainly have it and you can see where we've got to. Oh, that's brilliant. Thanks, Sue. Um, next question is from Mark Armstrong. Uh, when reducing your workforce by 30%, some of these will have been the leaders. How did you get them engaged, leading the change, etc.? Um, well, I think, I think the key is that that has to come from the top. So for getting our senior leaders to set out what it is this organisation is here for, we went back and completely reviewed our purpose completely reviewed the kind of the, the core of what we offer given that we had to take out such large sums and reduce by such a large amount. And yes, we have lost people right the way across the organisation and some of whom we, we, we reduced our leadership team. Um, I think we went, went from seven directors, we're now down to three. We went from 26 heads of service, now there are only 16. So we lost quite a significant leadership cadre, um, but those leaders that remain have been selected to remain. So it wasn't a question of, you know, keeping what we've got. We actually selected people into those positions, but based on our competency framework, based on their attitude, and based on their ability to deliver this change. 
Thanks, Sue. Uh, next question is from Meg Crawford. The personal leadership programme sounds great. Was it expensive, and how did you justify the cost at a time of austerity? Right, okay. Um, it costs us about £1,500 a head. But bad leadership costs us at least three times that and more. So, to my mind, it's an investment in the leadership capacity, capability, and uh, real leadership commitment across our organization. And so, yes, I say on, on that grounds, but £1,500 for a three-day course. Uh, it is a three-day program. It's very intensive. It includes an overnighter on the first two days and then a follow-up day. So, yes, it is a cost to the organization. But I think the cost of poor leadership is so much greater. And I think I was able to sell it to the organization on the basis of this is making a big difference to the way that people behave and the way that they think and the level of commitment we're able to, in, to, to get from our senior leaders and from other leaders across the organization. And the importance of engagement, communicating, and actually really driving out those kind of proper transformational behaviors that we're looking for, I think actually it's worth every penny. And I've got buy-in from senior leaders. The senior team have done it. Uh, it's now rolled out. We're now just below service level, uh, service manager level with it. And we've run some very much more open programs so that staff know what staff can see the other side of it. So the investment has been quite high, but I think absolutely, absolutely worth it. Thanks, right, Sue. Uh, next question probably ties into a bit of that as well. It's from Christine Smith. Um, how, how have you, ups you upskilled and supported your managers to deliver change? Well, we put out five years ago we started to work on designing a series of bite-sized learning sessions, e-learning um, offer, face-to-face -face learning, and a whole suite of interventions which people can access in terms of getting the skills and building a personal toolkit for managing and leading change. And most of our managers will have been through that. Uh, we certainly have required some of them to do it, and, we, and others have had. We've also had some coaching in place for managers struggling with it. But those skills, so bite-sized learning around how do you deliver a difficult message, how do you lead a team that's kind of, you know, uh, been uh, put together from other, you know, bring two teams together in a different way, how do you change the working style, culture of a team. So there are all of these are bite-sized learning sessions that people can access either by e-learning or by face-to-face. -face. And so gradually we built up their skills. We also run a manager's forum and managers conferences so we bring managers together to talk to them about the key principles of managing change and also we run something called management huddles and the management huddles are where we can bring groups of managers together to share their experiences of managing this and so we've shared good practice and we've shared you know pain and angst as well but those management huddles are proving to be incredibly powerful in getting managers together to say actually do you know what you're not on your own in this that there's other people who are doing this sort of stuff, and some of this worked for them, might that work for you? So it's like a sort of uh, a very fairly formalized networking across the organization in order to spread that skill set and build the confidence of managers to lead change. Right, so we've got a couple of other requests um, just around an overview in the toolbox and uh, getting a copy of the six questions for measuring engagement levels. But um, as mentioned earlier, what shall I just work with yourself and we can get them shared? Yes. Yeah, no problem. Come, come back to me and I'll see what I can share. Yep. Brilliant. Okay. Um, next question is from Amanda Spark from Angus Council. How do you bring the competency framework to life and ensure it becomes embedded? Um, I think that is hard work. Uh, it's shoulder to the wheel all of the time, and it's a constant drip feed, really. So it's now embedded. We use it for recruitment and selection. We use it to drive our induction. We use it to drive our training programs. We use it uh, as part of our performance process. Um, I am going to get rid of the annual appraisal. That's, that's, my, that's one of my aims. Um, so that instead of having an annual kind of... Um, top up of who's doing what, where actually we're building a performance culture and we're encouraging managers to use that competency framework as part of their one-to-ones, as part of their performance meetings with staff so that they focus on things like, you know, how are you, how are you doing, how are you doing this, what's, 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 
good for you, what's working well, what's, what's taxing you. So they have much broader conversations and not just visit a task list through one-to-one. So using the competency framework as widely, as, uh, as often as possible, and actually it is, it is um, we've also run some, some workshops for staff, workshops for managers. We run clinics so people can drop in if they want to understand more about using competency to drive up performance. So lots of effort going on around that. And it's just drip feed and every opportunity, really. So next question is from David Brown from Dundee Council. Um, would, would you be willing to share your uh, leadership e-learning and training modules? Um, well, yes, I, I mean, to a certain extent, I think, yeah, it, as easy, it depends how easy it is to do that because they're in, they're in all sorts of different formats. I can certainly give an overview of what we do. Um, and our leadership, yes, I, I, talk to me afterwards, David, and you and I will see what it is that, that, that I've got that you can, you can have. Right. And as anything I can share with you, I promise you that I will. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, next question from Fiona, Fiona Donaldson. Um, how did you engage with staff who are more difficult to reach, i.e. loan workers, shift workers, or non-office based staff? Yeah, again, we rely on our managers to do that. Um, although, my chief exec and our leader do a regular roadshow. So twice a year, in fact, he's out now, he's out this morning, my chief exec, talking to groups of staff right across the county. As you imagine, we're, we're spread across, right across Warwickshire. We've got quite a large geography. Uh, so he's out in the north of the county today at a, um, one of our, or somebody's office, and he's just open house. So he'll do a bit of talking about where we are, where we're going, what's happening next, and then he has a, an open forum session where people can ask him any questions and talk to him. So that's on one level. We do a lot of communication via different channels. So we use Yammer, we use our intranet, we also publish newsletters, but also we rely on managers. We have a fairly disciplined core brief, team briefing process, but we would expect our managers to engage and talk to their staff. And again, that's part of the skill set that we've given them and the requirement that we make of our managers. Thanks, Sue. Uh, next question is from Donna Redford from Aberdeenshire Council. Interesting to note customer satisfaction has increased despite doing more for themselves. How was this achieved and over what time scale? Um, over the last, I think, over the last five years, we've seen a gradual move towards digital by default. So most of our services now you can access via the, um, via the website. We've set up one-stop shops. But we've also done a lot of community engagement. So we have got people out. Um, we've done it through fire stations. We've done it through uh, libraries, which are all now community managed. And we've got a big team who are building community capacity. So a lot of talking with our citizens, a lot of shifting the expectations that citizens have. So it's no longer, well, what's the council doing about that? But how can the council help me to do this? But that's taken about three to five years, I think, of, of shifting that. But we've also got much slicker at responding. So if you, if you come into the website, chances are you can solve your problem really, really quickly. And therefore, the kind of net promoter scores and, and measuring that customer satisfaction is showing that that's increasing. So actually, if people who do access our services digitally are getting a very quick service. They're getting what they want without having to go anywhere or do anything. Uh, and, so, and we're working hard also at man, man, managing our relationships with those who don't have access to digital services and thinking about how we do that. So yeah, that's how we've, that's how we've done it. Uh, but it's been a slow and long haul. And not, not without some effort, I have to say. Thanks, Sue. Um, next question is from Scott McLean, again from Aberdeenshire. Um, how, did a role, how big a role did the use of technology play in achieving your savings targets? Um, it's pretty central to what we're doing. Um, internally, we've moved much more to self-service. Um, you know, staff themselves, manage themselves much more readily by uh, the internet and by internet access, wider internet access, not just the intranet, um, and also digital by default. So good managing good customer service systems. We've put in place a customer service center. So most calls into the council will go to one place 
and actually most calls can be dealt with very quickly by a very highly skilled customer service team. And I've done the same in HR. So in HR, I have a customer service team, and I'd say probably well over 70% of the calls that come into HR are a one call, one phone call solution. So they ring up, they've got a question, and somebody can answer it straight away. If they can't, they'll escalate. And that's the same, it mirrors the customer service front end for the council, and it's working very well. So yes, technology has played a very, very large and important role in what we do. Next, uh, next question is from Mike Keeley. Given the reductions in budgets our staff, was there also a reduction or removal of services, or was it a case of everybody doing more with less? I think we started off with the former. Uh, uh, sorry, with the latter. So I think I think we started doing like every other council. I think we did all the salami slicing, and like every other council, I think we found that people were kind of papering over the cracks and keeping going in spite of the reductions. Subsequently, I mean, if, if you think, we've been at this since 2010, so we're six years in now, it's actually services either being delivered very differently or not delivered at all. So some things have stopped, but not as much as we thought we would stop. We're still doing a lot of more with less. In fact, we're now doing more and more and more with less and less and less, and people will recognize that. If you're sitting out there and you're in a council, you'll absolutely identify with that. But at the moment, and this next round, we'll take things out that probably people thought were sacred cows. So, you know, we're, we're looking at doing children's services, running children's services differently. Uh, we're certainly running our adult services differently. We've done some outsourcing. We've done some shared service work. We're doing a lot of work around health integration. So there is a lot of very different ways of delivering and accessing these services. And pulling back to focusing on priorities. Um, but so I think we started off with doing more with less. I think we're we're now going to start stopping things really. Let's see. Um, next question was from Carol Wilcox. How many managers or leaders did you put through this program, and was it mandatory? Uh, no, we're we're very reluctant to make anything mandatory here. Um, some of our information governance stuff is mandatory. Um, and some of our communication stuff is mandatory. But I, we're very reluctant to make things mandatory because we'd rather have a culture where people understand why it's important and that they take themselves to these things because we think that the buy-in is better. Um, I'd say that probably at least 80% of our managers have gone through the change tools, the change in the bite-sized learning and development associated with change with resilience, with managing stress, with delivering difficult messages. Uh, in terms of the personal leadership program, uh, certainly we're at 80 to 90 percent of senior leaders. That will soon go up to over 90 percent because we're almost almost through all of those now. And we've rolled it out to probably about 60 percent of our service managers. Um, so we're, getting, we're beginning to get some critical mass. And over the time frame, sorry, the time frame has been over about the last two years, 18 months to two years. So it's, it's a little bit slow, but it's, we're getting there now. Uh, next question from Ali here, Clark Manager Council. Uh, were your executives and senior management engaged with your activities from the outset? How did you emphasize the importance of their visibility and continued engagement with staff? So a couple of questions in there. Yep. Um, yes, they were. I think we're very lucky here. We have a senior leadership team that recognise the importance of good leadership. Um, we have a very visible um, and engaged chief exec and senior team. Uh, it doesn't come naturally to all of them, and we've had to kind of build their confidence uh, and remind them from time to time that this is important. But they do get uh, um, a kind of constant... A drip feed from me around how important this is and also how successful it is. So I give them regular feedback on what people are saying, I give them regular feedback on what people are looking for, and actually because they're out and about picking it up for themselves, so it's getting easier to get them to do it. But most of us, most of our senior leaders are, are very engaged with this, very switched on, and recognize why this is important in terms of shifting the culture. 
Right, so, uh, next question is David Brown from Dundee City again. Um, do you have any leadership conferences within your own authority? If so, how often and what kind of topics do you focus on? Uh, yes, we do. We run managers' conferences for uh, each of our groups. We, we're organised across four groups. So there's our people group, which has got children and adult services. We've got a communities group, we've got a resources group, and we've got fire and rescue. And each of those runs a managers' conference three times a year, when all of the managers come together with their senior leaders in that group, and they can focus on what they like, but generally speaking, at the moment, I mean, for instance, our last one, we focused on productivity, because within my workforce strategy, I've got productivity and efficiency, um, we've got leadership, we've got collaboration. So actually what we're doing is focusing our managers' conferences each time on one of those so they can really see where, that, where their activities and what they do and what the organization is doing is hooked into the workforce strategy. So we will focus on really hot topics, things that are important for them. Sometimes we bring outside speakers in, sometimes we do it ourselves. Generally speaking, we like to have a sort of facilitated workshop so that they're active and it focuses on engagement of managers in delivering this change and transformation. Thanks. And just a follow-up from David as well, who's wondering, um, how do the management huddles work? Are they physical, uh, a physical get-together or more like an online blog? Uh, they're, they're physical get-togethers and they really do huddle. They will go somewhere over coffee and cakes and they'll sit and they'll it's usually facilitated by one of my team uh, in order to, and they might huddle around a subject, they might huddle around a problem, they might huddle around a case study, or somebody will say, actually, do you know what, I'm really grappling with this. So we'll pull a huddle together and invite probably half a dozen, no more than ten, and they'll get together and they have a physical meeting, probably for an hour, hour and a half at most. So it's fairly short, sharp. But what they do within that facilitated meeting is explore, you know, what the problem is and how it's almost like an action learning set. But we call them management huddles because actually what it does, it brings managers together to share ideas and share their experience. Next question is from Gordon McFarlane. As the number of managers and leaders reduces, we're expecting even more from remaining people. How much focus have you given to the development of new skills, for example, commercial skills? Yep, we've put in a whole suite of um, learning uh, interventions around developing commercial skills. Um, we developed a whole raft of things. Obviously, we have traded services as well. Uh, managers are wanting, wanting managers to be more entrepreneurial. We want them to manage contracts better. So there's a series of bite-sized sessions, some face-to-face, -face, some uh, internet-based, some e-learning. We've got an e-learning platform, so a lot of it's on the e-learning platform, which is designed to build exactly those skills. And one of the things that we're doing within our workforce planning now is about understanding what skill set is we need going forward. And interestingly enough, we're looking at much more generic skills, leadership, management, communications, attitude, that all those kinds of things are, are coming much more to the fore. So actually our workforce is more agile and more flexible. Um, but yes, we have put in a whole suite of learning around commercial skills. Okay, next question is from Christine Smith. Engagement is key in all things OD. Have your positive and not so successful experiences in this, in this engagement piece altered your OD strategy? If so, how? Um, can you say the last bit again? Engagement is key in all things OD. Have your positive and not so successful experiences in this engagement piece altered your OD strategy? Um, yeah, to, to a certain extent, I think we are, I, I want to foster an appreciative and positive culture. So we focus on the positives and the culture that we want to build is, you know, if something goes wrong, it's not about blame or shame, more importantly, it's about learning how we could get that better. So we do ask ourselves, you know, in that, did we communicate that properly? How did that go? We do do a wash up on particular pieces to learn, learn from that and to allow us to develop better processes going forward. Um, and so we learned from, when we first did our first um, round of organize, the one organizational plan, which is our first kind of big savings plan, 2014 to eight to six, sorry, 2010 to 2014, 
we learnt some lessons around that, around better engagement, better communication. And we've put that into good use in terms of our OD strategy. Our OD strategy is, is really based around supporting managers, engaging and mobilising managers and staff to recognise the need for change. And that's kind of been the root of it, really. And OD, OD in organisations, I mean, people don't necessarily get OD or understand it, I think. And we've stopped talking about it now. So what we really, really do is that getting behind teams, getting in, helping teams and individuals to do what they need to do and help them get to where they want to go. So that is leading and driving that transformation. Um, it's less coordinated than you might think because it's about getting in with a team and understanding what's needed where they are. And we've had some teams who've completely reconfigured or who've picked up, you know, We've, we, you know, we've done it here. We've got different people coming into our team. How do you how do you make that happen? How do you change the? How do you allow people to understand the culture or build the right culture within teams? So a lot, a lot of focus on culture and behaviours and attitudes in our organisation, uh, and that's that's been critical. And I think we've learned some lessons. So I don't think I've got anything that's gone badly wrong. I think there are things where we could have done things better. Thanks, Sue. Um, next question is from Karen Donaldson at Perth and Ross. How are you ensuring that you retain talent at a middle manager level when there are now less opportunities at senior levels with a, a, about a 40% reduction in your director slash head of service roles? Yeah, it's, that, is, that is a big problem for us. Retention, attraction, retention, retaining middle ground talent. And especially as we see the private sector gain momentum and uh, offer better salaries and opportunities, we are seeing a steady trickle. And of course, the government aren't making it any easier. You'll all be familiar with exit caps and IR35 and clawback, which means that we'll see a drain of senior talent, I think, from the top of the organization. Um, but what we do do is recognize where people are um, contributing. We have star awards, recognition awards, thank you, praise, thanks, feedback, building a performance culture, and also emphasizing the connection that we have. And we're very lucky in the public sector um, that we have a really strong connection between the work we do and the people we serve. And actually, that's a lot of what people are looking for in organizations is job satisfaction and a real sense of purpose. And we do tend to try to feed that back lots. So we give, we give a lot of case examples and spend a lot of time getting examples in our communities of where we really have made a difference and feeding that back. But I don't think we're going to win that battle overall. I think we will see a steady trickle of talent out uh, to the private sector as it picks up. Although we have seen people go out and come back. So, you know, it's all, all fair really across this employment game. Uh, but from my point of view, the important thing is that we do our very best for the staff we have. Great, so, uh, we've got quite a few questions coming in here about the annual appraisals. Um, people are very interested to hear in how and your progress in removing these and what, what kind of initiative you might put in their place. Right, okay. I, I've offered a, it's a carrot, isn't it, really? I've said to, I've said to kind of my, my colleagues at senior level and, and to managers, I will, I will take the burden of annual appraisal off you. And they all, their faces all light up, as you can, as you can imagine. And I say, however, you have to meet me. Uh, this is like building, a, building a, a bridge, and then you can sell the ferry. And I said, I'm not selling the ferry until we've built the bridge. And the bridge is building a performance culture. So I want to see in this organization, and we've done a lot of work around this lately, and in fact, we've rolled out another suite of interventions for managers to really help them get better at one-to-one, -one, get better at having difficult conversations, get better at having good quality feedback conversations on a regular basis. My argument with annual appraisal is you'd never run any other kind of relationship well on the way we run annual appraisal. So let's imagine you know, if you're your partner, and on the 1st of January you say, OK, here we go, happy, happy New Year, happy birthday, happy anniversary, I love you, and uh, you're really great, and happy Christmas. You wouldn't do it, would you? You just wouldn't do it. But we do that in annual appraisal. We save everything up, and we say, right, there you go. What we need is a much more ongoing performance feedback loop. 
and having good conversations all the time in our organization. I said, and when I can be assured that we do that, I'll tear up the appraisal one page at a time. And I will do it. And in fact, we'll probably do it for the next, so this, this will be the last cycle because we're starting to get there. So actually, people report that they have regular meetings with their managers. They get good feedback. They get feedback which is timely and specific. And that's what you need. And, but we need to find a way to make sure that that is happening before we can uh, tear up the appraisal. But we will do it. I will do it. So the next question is from uh, Billy Swan. What is the size of your OD team and how have you deployed, it? How have you deployed them to d help deliver transfer transformational change? Okay, it's, into, it's really in two, two bits. I have HR business and OD partners, HR and OD business partners, who do the, the lion's share of the strategic organization development work out in the business. They're true business partners. They don't do any casework. They are, we've trained them up, we've given them some development so that they really are strategic partners in the business. So I've got one of those in each of the groups. They're supported by HR and OD consultants who are kind of support those business partners, again in the strategic uh, level. And I've got a very small OD team which has only got four people in it. So they are very, very, very small. And the way we use them, as I say, the business partners tend to do the, the diagnosis and understanding it, and then they'll get together with the OD team to design the interventions. And then we might do that ourselves if we can do it, or we might bring in uh, and, and uh, contract with people, subcontractors, who come in to deliver some of the interventions for us. If we can do it ourselves, we do, but we are a very, very thin resource. So it's not a huge resource, not by any manner of means. Right, so the next question is from Stella Matimba. How have you dealt with uh, resistance to change from members of staff? Um, again, it's about that engagement piece. So where there is resistance, it's about getting people to understand the need. People don't like change, and, and you know, but in the public sector, it's the only constant. It's, it's the thing we do all of the time. And we've said to people, this is, this is where it's at. So we've been very open with people about the scale of change, the pace of change, understanding and really setting out our principles, what our design principles are for the organization, the vision, the objectives. So we're really, really clear about that. And where you get resistance, pockets of resistance, it's a question of maybe a management huddle, maybe somebody going in, maybe a senior management team, team member going in and, and, and explaining and taking some time out to get people to understand. There will be people who just don't like it and who don't, and they will go, and that's probably the right thing. So some churn is necessary. Um, you can't always be, you can't, you're not going to take everybody with you, but I think you have to recognize that, that you know, there's some effort required in helping people to understand why the change is necessary, what their role is in it, and how you can help them, and understand why the, what, what their resistance is. That's part of it. You know, listening to people. So we have staff forums. We have opportunities for staff to talk to any member of the senior team. So if they understand what it is that people are worried about, and then you can deal with it. Uh, I say to people, you know, if you don't tell me, I can't do anything about it. If you tell me, I can do something about it if I can, or I can explain why I can't. And I think that's the kind of, that's the way we've dealt with it, really. The next question is from Dougie Craig. What was the retention level of core staff, um, and how did, you, how did these changes impact on your reputation, particularly when recruiting? Um, our turnover is sitting at roughly 9% which actually is probably not high enough. Um, given that we probably need to see different people in the public sector now, I think we probably need to see a, a higher level of churn. Um, so our retention isn't bad. Um, we've got some hard to recruit areas. Social workers won't be a surprise to this audience. Uh, planners, um, and, uh, project managers are, are in difficult to recruit groups. But we're still holding our own. We're still recognized as a key employer in Warwickshire. And our staff, actually, in our staff survey, uh, said actually that, you know, that about 80% of them said that uh, Warwickshire County Council is a good employer. So we do measure it. 
so we have held on to our reputation. We do treat people properly. And even if we are moving people out of the organization, I like to think we're doing that fairly and we're doing it in a way which is sensitive. We also have a, I've invested in a redeployment officer who we do an awful lot of redeployment. And redeployment is really is seen as a key function within HR now because we try to, if people want to work with us, we try to give them new skills and help them move. If they want to go, we help them to do that. So there's also stuff, like, there's a good sense of outplacement offer around CV, build, CV building, interviewing, um, uh, skills, understanding how to kind of present yourself and job search. So we do an awful lot of work to help those people who are at risk of redundancy, but also to redeploy people where possible. Thanks. Uh, just to be a bit conscious of time here, but we've got still got a number of questions left, but we'll just um, have two or three more. Um, what kind? What examples of services stopped? Or uh, going back to an earlier question, what examples of services were stopped or pushed out of the community or volunteers? Um, vol libraries uh, is a classic. Most of our libraries now are community managed libraries, and they have become community hubs. So they're doing a lot more than library um, work. So they are sort of places where people can meet in the community, uh, it's access points in communities. So uh, we've stopped running centrally. We've got one centrally managed library, that's it. Um, we've stopped school transport. We've stopped, um, we've pushed out a lot of our social care. So a lot of our reablement services have gone to external providers. They're commissioned. We've got a commissioning model across the authority. So we commission a lot of services rather than do them for ourselves. Um, volunteers are involved, an awful lot of volunteers working around um, community support, building community capacity, uh, youth work, all of that kind of stuff. We're sort of building, trying to build that capacity uh, and supporting young people into employment. Uh, next question is from one of my colleagues at the Improvement Service, Gerard. Um, what has the experience been in the role of elected members in the process? Um, <laughs> patchy, I think. Um, we have elected members who kind of kind of get it in the council chamber, but don't really think that things apply to them or where they are. And most of your audience out there in public sector will be laughing now because they'll recognize that. So we have councillors who will sit in the council chamber and say, right, we're not going to fill potholes anymore. And then we'll get a telephone call on Monday morning saying, you haven't filled the pothole in my village. Uh, and that kind of thing. So they are, they are very parochial. They're, they're quite locally focused. It's quite difficult to get elected members to recognize the consequences of some of the decisions that they take centrally. And in fact, we started now, over the last 18 months, running workshops for members to help them understand the impact of those decisions and helping them to kind of follow through and work with us so the officers help them to explain, actually, do you know what, if you cut that budget there, the knock-on effect is this, this, and this. You know, that's what it is. And so we don't get them on television going, well, it's terrible, the council has stopped this. And you think, well, actually, two weeks ago, you sat in the council chamber and voted for that. So the, it, elected members are difficult because what they're mainly concerned about are their constituents and their, their own area. Trying to get them to take a more global view uh, of, of the county as a whole. And in particular, I mean, if you can imagine Warwickshire, we've got quite a clear north-south divide. We've got a very industrialized north where we've got some quite high areas of deprivation. We've got intergenerational worklessness. We've got problems around you know, troubled communities. And in the south, around Stratford-on-Avon, we've got a very affluent middle class, and it's huge generalization. But to get the southern elected members to recognize the issues in the north, and sometimes we take them and show them, and sometimes we kind of, so making it real, helping them to understand, has been a big part of what we've been doing. Um, we have portfolio holders. Uh, we're encouraged to have our portfolio holders in with us, understanding what we're doing, understanding the implications of the decisions that they're making, but it is a hard, it's hard work, it is hard. Thanks Sue. I think we've probably got time just to squeeze in one more question. Um, there are several that haven't been answered, but I've taken note of these and will um, we'll follow up following the webinar. Um, so the final, okay. que final question is, Chris Greer, um, there's been a lot of talk about savings. Did you manage to maximise revenue and generate additional income to offset some of these savings? 
We do. We have traded services. Um, which do offset some of our and, and one of our one of our key design principles is to increase trading uh, in order to help us sort of boost the coffers as it were. I mean in HR my services are traded to schools, to to fire and rescue services, to other councils. So we're doing quite a bit around trading services and I'd say probably uh, I think we've got something like I don't know, our turnover is about twenty one million. Uh, on traded services across the council, so catering, cleaning, um, we offer a lot of schools improvement services and all of our traded services together, IT services, add up to a, a trading sort of turnover of about 21 million, which isn't, isn't, isn't uh, as good as it might be, we're working on that, uh, but that is one of our, one of our elements of, of, of uh, effort really, is to build those traded services so that we augment the services that we provide. Okay, thanks Sue. Um, I think that's us just about out of time for today, so just very quickly, as mentioned at the start, this webinar series is part of our ongoing Change Managers Network group. Um, if you'd like to receive information on future webinars or access recordings from previous ones, including this one, then please feel free to join the group. Uh, we exist as a Knowledge Hub community. Um, you'll need to make an account first, but um, then if you apply for membership, then we'll be happy to have you. Um, our next webinar will actually be uh, a week today on the um, with David Waller presenting on benefits tracking. Um, so I'll also send out information on how to join these following this webinar, as well as uh, pulling together the recording, the slides, and all the resources that were mentioned today. Uh, finally, I'd just like to thank Sue um, for giving up our time to present today. That was absolutely brilliant. Um, and oh, thank you. Um, I'll. And I hope to see everyone at future webinars. Um, there's also a short survey that will follow this session. If you can give us as much feedback as possible, including information and speakers, the kind of speakers you'd like to see at future webinars, and that would really help us here. So uh, thanks again to Sue, and I hope, I hope you enjoyed the session. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, David. I enjoyed it. Cheers. Okay.